This week's blog post is my favorite recommendations from 2022, part two. In 2022, I emailed 158 art-related items to members of my free Sunday recommendations list. For supporters, I recommended 52 more items. This week, I'm giving you my favorites in the categories of painting and sculpture. Eight of these were originally shared only with supporters. These two are tied for first. On the left is heads from Michelangelo's Sistine ceiling, which was painted 1508 to 1512. When I visited the Sistine Chapel years ago, I was part of a group tour, and I was hustled out of the room long before I could finish squinting up at the ceiling. Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, the exhibition, includes nearly every part of the Sistine that was painted by Michelangelo via high-definition life-size photos that are displayed at floor level. The exception is The Last Judgment, which is in a photo that's smaller than the original, and the Inuti, which I happen to like, are mostly missing. Size does matter. Seeing these at full scale is very different from seeing them in a coffee table book or on a computer monitor. The exhibition is touring the U.S. well into 2023. If you walk through it with the audio guide, it'll take at least two hours. People often talk with awe about Michelangelo's muscular bodies, but I was most impressed by the variety of ages and expressions on the faces. This is a collage of the photos that I took of the photos that someone else took. Okay, the other tied for first is Hiroshi Yoshida's The Sparkling Sea from 1926. In the mid-19th century, ukiyo-e woodblock prints became popular in the West, with subjects such as beautiful women, actors, wrestlers, folk tales, and historical events. Such prints fell out of fashion in the early 1900s. But beginning in 1915, Watanabe Shozaburo single-handedly created a revival of woodblock prints by publishing and selling a new style known as Shinhanga. Shinhanga prints feature a fusion of Japanese and Western art with natural subjects such as birds, animals, flowers, and landscapes. As many as 20 separate blocks may be cut to add colors for each print. Yoshida, one of the greatest artists of the Shinhanga style, is famous for landscapes and seascapes such as this one. Many of these prints are available for sale from a couple hundred to a couple thousand dollars each. Okay, these are the runners-up in painting. On the left is Rolf Armstrong's self-portrait from 1914. Armstrong, whose dates are 1889 to 1960, studied at the Art Institute of Chicago and the Académie Julian in Paris, and then began focusing on paintings of glamorous women from magazine covers. This is the golden age of American illustration. If you're interested in that, look up my comments on Maxfield Parrish's early career in Artist Entrepreneurs. From 1912 through 1936, Armstrong created about 200 cover illustrations, including many of silent screen actors. In the 1920s and 30s, as color photography replaced illustrations on magazine covers, Armstrong began to create calendar art and advertisements, among which were some of the most reproduced art of World War II. The New York Times dubbed him the creator of the calendar girl. His self-portrait is striking. I love the way the light models his face. Next one is Willard Metcalf on the Suffolk Coast, 1885. Metcalf was a member of the Cornish colony, which formed after St. Gowden's began summering in Cornish, New Hampshire. I wouldn't want to be in this boat on those seas, but I very much like the colors and the composition of this painting. Suffolk County is on the eastern end of Long Island in New York. And the third runner-up is N.C. Wyeth's Winter from 1909. Thirty years or so ago, I saw this work on exhibition at the Brandywine Museum in Chadsford, Pennsylvania. Since I didn't remember the title, it's taken me that long to find it again. The subject doesn't particularly grab me, but that composition is remarkable. Circular, but not symmetrical. The way the cloak and the bird complete the light's circle is just so satisfying. I really like many of N.C. Wyeth's works, and I was pleased to discover that the Brandywine Museum now has an online catalogue raisonné of them. Two more runners-up. On the left is George Innes's Lackawanna Valley from around 1856, which is at the National Gallery in Washington. 
It's a scene set in Pennsylvania, not far from where I grew up. I still feel a strong pull for low mountains that roll away into the distance. Innes, whose dates are 1825 to 1894, was commissioned by the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad to depict the railroad's first roundhouse at Scranton, Pennsylvania. As in Thomas Cole's 1836, The Oxbow, industrial progress is contrasted with wilderness. I used Innes's painting in my book Central Park the Early Years to illustrate the Hudson River School's idea that man can either look at nature and enjoy it, or he can explore and tame and settle it. To Innes, those were equally valid choices. And finally, in the painting category, Frederick Lord Layton's Flaming June. The Museo de Ponce in Puerto Rico was severely damaged in an earthquake in 2020. While repairs are underway, they've sent a few of their works out on loan. From October 2022 until February 2024, Flaming June will be on view at the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. I'm working on a series of posts on Flaming June. Can't promise when they'll be ready, but check my Instagram feed to see. Moving on to sculpture. There are three works, no, four works tied for first. Sometimes I just don't feel like making these hard choices. On the left is Harriet Whitney Frismuth's The Vine from 1923. This is one of my favorite sculptures even more so when I look at the abstract works that critics were beginning to acclaim in the decade that Frismuth sculpted this. I did two blog posts on the vine in 2016 before I started the Sunday Recommendations. You can find them on my website. On the right is Daniel Chester French's Spirit of Life, also known as the Trask Memorial from 1915. Spencer Trask, whose dates are 1844 to 1909, helped Saratoga Springs, New York, regain its reputation as a health resort. The figure that French created for his memorial holds a bowl from which water, presumably the famous Saratoga Springs water, falls into a pool. If you do a search on my website for the Trask Memorial, you'll find the models that Daniel Chester French did for the head, which is also very lovely, all by itself. In the 1910s, Daniel Chester French was America's most popular sculptor. Also tied for first is the Critios Boy from circa 480 BC. When watching a video tour of the new Acropolis Museum in Athens, there's a clip from that on the right-hand side, I saw an old, a very old friend from my very first art history course. He's only three feet, 10 inches high, but enormously important. Here's the background. Around 600 BC, the Greeks began creating life-size sculptures based on Egyptian models. Over the next hundred years, the symmetrical, formal poses of the models were kept, but one sculptor after another taught himself to represent accurately the shapes and details of the human body. By 500 BC, anyone who visited the Acropolis in Athens would have seen a series of kouroi and kouroi, standing sculptures of men and women, that were lessons in how to represent ears and ankles and knees and other anatomical details. In 490 BC, the Persians invaded the Greek mainland and were repelled. In 480 BC, the Persians attacked again. This time they sacked Athens twice, raising buildings and destroying sculptures. The Greeks regarded their final defeat of the Persians at sea in 480 BC, on land in 479, not just as a military victory, but as a validation of government by citizens rather than by an absolute ruler, and of order over irrationality. For more on this, read Herodotus's History of the Persian Wars, and see my video on Byron's The Isles of Greece. The Athenians buried the sculptures that had been smashed on the Acropolis where they fell, and began creating art again. Confident in the superiority of their culture, they carved new sculptures with no trace of the stylized symmetry they had adopted from the Egyptians a century earlier. The new sculptures were all in what is known as the classical style, in which each figure was shown not as a fascinating assemblage of details, but as an organic whole. We know that style had just begun in 480 BC because the Critios boy, who stands in contraposto rather than in the Egyptian pose of one foot forward, was buried in the rubble left by the Persians, and he's the only sculpture in this style to be found in the Acropolis excavations. 
You can see more on the Greek study of anatomy and contraposto in Innovators in Sculpture. And the fourth of the items tied for first is Augustus St. Gaudens's The Shift Children, 1885. St. Gaudens, who worked as a maker of cameos when he was a teenager, later used his knowledge to sculpt this beautiful low-relief portrait of two children with a Scottish deerhound. Jacob H. Schiff, 1847 to 1920, an immigrant from Germany, became a prominent banker at Kuhn Loeb & Company, where he funded the Japanese during the Russo-Japanese War and financed several American railroads. He was a major donor to Jewish charities in the U.S. and a leader of the Jewish community from 1880 to 1920. Schiff left an estate of about $50 million, $740 million or so today. He was succeeded at Kuhn Loeb by his son, Mortimer Leo Schiff, who appears as an eight-year-old on this relief. According to a label at the St. Gaudens National Historical Site, the Deerhound actually belonged to St. Gaudens. It wasn't the Schiff children's. In 1905, Jacob Schiff paid for this replica to be made for the Metropolitan Museum's collection. For more on the career of St. Gaudens, see Artist Entrepreneurs. And two runners-up in sculpture. On the left is Evangelos Frudakis's Reaching, 1996. This is one of my favorite sculptures at Brook Green Gardens. Frudakis, one of a family of sculptors, also created the signer in Philadelphia. And finally, Desiderio da Settignano, young boy, possibly Christ child, circa 1460. This is at the National Gallery in Washington. Look at the way the marble rises and falls over his cheeks, under his eyes, around his chin. Look at the way the texture of the hair is rendered. You can tell its thickness. You can tell the way it's curling. Look at the tilt of the head on the neck. It's just slightly not symmetrical, suggesting movement. Have you ever seen a sculpture that looks so much like a living person? And yet it's not naturalistic. This is not a random boy in a random pose that the sculpture just happened to copy. Desiderio de Satignano, Bernardo and Antonio Rossellino, and Benedetto da Maiano all worked in Renaissance Florence during the mid-1400s. They produced charming, exquisitely carved works such as this one, in what is called the sweet style. It was inspired by Donatello's Pazzi Madonna. Again, you can see Innovators in Sculpture for more on the Donatello work and the works that succeeded it. In 2022, I published three books. Starry Solitudes is a collection of poetry, 98 poems that I've recommended over the past five years. Sunny Sundays is highlights of five years of Sunday recommendations. The timeline 1900 to 2021 covers events worldwide, U.S. politics and culture, economics, science and technology, books, visual arts, architecture, film and TV, and music. DianeDurantyWriter.com has hundreds of posts on sculpture, painting, architecture, and my other obsessions. To join the Sunday Recommendations email list, visit the URL that's on the screen or email me. And you can say, well done, Diane or support my work and receive rewards by means of the tip jar on dianedrantywriter.com. As always, thank you for listening.